Greetings, Mother Factors! My name is Sam, and today we're going to be talking all about the Superintendent of Spooks, Head Honcho of Horror, and the CEO of Scares, Stephen King. He's written some of the biggest books of all time, and at a lightning pace, sending shivers down the spines of millions. Impressive, right? I've probably done that to only, what, two or three people tops? That wasn't just a nightmare fuel. Anyway, but who, or what, inspired Annie Wilkes from his 1987 classic Misery? What exactly are Stephen King's dollar babies? And why is it that every time I get pig's blood dumped on my head, I don't develop any supernatural powers at all? Total ripoff. Two out of three of those questions are going to be answered, so turn off the lights, turn on some spooky sound effects, and prepare to be positively petrified as we embark upon 101 facts about Stephen King. But before we do, it's best to mention the sponsor of this here video, horror writer Rami Ungar's creepy new novel, Rose. Rose follows the story of, well, Rose, Rose Taggart specifically, who wakes up one day with no memory of the past two years with her body transformed into a horrific plant-like form with no explanation. While the people in her life react, it appears that some aren't all they seem, leading to a vicious fight for survival. It's some deep, creepy stuff, and you can read it right now, just by venturing onto the Amazon link down below, in both the description and the pinned comment. Be warned though, this is an adult horror adventure, not for the faint of heart. Speaking of not for the faint of heart, number one. Stephen Edwin King is an American author of horror, supernatural, fantasy, and science fiction. His name is synonymous with chilling literature about supernatural events happening to everyday people. Like my haunted toaster that won't stop calling me Fact Boy. Yeah, it's horrible. Write a novel about that, King. Number two. King was born on the 21st of September 1947 in Portland, Maine, which I'm assured is the better of the two American Portlands. King's father was Donald Edwin King, and his mother was delightfully named Nellie Ruth King, her maiden name Pillsbury. Yes, Stephen King's mother was called Nellie Ruth Pillsbury. Number three. Sadly, when King was just two years old, his father told his family he was going to buy a pack of cigarettes and never came back, which, as you can imagine, left them under a great financial strain. King's father was never heard from again. And by never heard from again, I mean that years later, it was discovered that King's father lived relatively close by with a new wife and four other kids. Classy. Number four. As a result, King's mother raised Stephen and his older brother, David, by herself. Enduring frequent money troubles, the family moved around a lot, which saw King spend stretches of his early childhood in De Pierre, which is in Wisconsin, as well as Fort Wayne, Indiana, and Stratford, Connecticut. When King was 11, his family returned to Maine, where his mother cared for her parents until they passed away. She then became a caregiver at a local residential home for the mentally challenged. Number five. King was apparently not in the best of health as a young child. Perhaps as a result of his poverty-stricken and unstable home life, King was frequently unwell, such that he actually had to repeat the first grade due to numerous absences. Number six. On a terrifying note, and this is Stephen King we're talking about, as a child, he apparently witnessed one of his friends be struck and killed by a train, after which he returned home seemingly in shock and completely unable to speak. Only later did the family learn of the child's death, and King himself states he has no memory of the event. Some have speculated that the experience may have psychologically inspired much of King's darker work, although he has never stated as such. Number seven. On one fateful day in his childhood, Stephen and his brother found a box of their father's belongings while rummaging around in their attic. Amongst Donald's things, they found a copy of The Lurker of the Threshold, a collection of short stories by famed horror and supernatural fiction writer H.P. Lovecraft. King later stated, I knew that I'd found home when I read that book, suggesting that it served as something of an inspiration for his, well, life. Number eight. King began his fledgling writing career in January of 1959, when his brother decided to publish his own local newspaper named Dave's Rag, using a now outdated copying machine called a mimeograph. King wrote stories for the publication, which his enterprising older brother sold for five cents an issue. Number seven. King began writing and submitting short stories to various publishers during his early teenage years. He stated himself that every time he received a rejection letter, he impaled it on a nail in his wall. And by the time he was 14, he'd accrued so many rejections that the nail was unable to support their weight. Not one to be discouraged, King replaced the nail with a larger spike and continued writing. Although that really does sound like a health and safety issue, but let's move on. Number 10. King's work was first published for realties in the magazine Comics Review in 1965, with his story I Was a Teenage Grave Robber, which the editors retitled to In a Half World of Terror. The story ran about 6,000 words in length and told the tale of a scientist who bred giant maggots, which, to be fair, is exactly what I'd do if I were a scientist. Number 11. Ch 
During his childhood, King attended Durham Elementary School and Lisbon Falls High School in his home state of Maine. From 1966, King attended the University of, you guessed it, Maine. While there, he wrote a weekly column called Steve King's Garbage Truck for the student newspaper, which was called The Main Campus. Number 12. During his time at university, King also became active in student politics and served as a member of the student senate. He came to support the anti-war movement on campus, viewing US involvement in the Vietnam War as unconstitutional. Number 13. In 1967, King made his very first professional short story sale with The Glass Floor, which he had submitted to startling mystery stories. The sale bagged him a cool $35, which in 2019 would be the equivalent to little under $270, so not too shabs. Number 14. While at university, which I hasten to remind you was in Maine, King fell in love with a fellow student named Tabitha Spruce. Yet another fantastic name, I mean, I mean, wow. King and Spruce met in the university library. Nerds. The pair married in January of 1971, the year after the birth of their first child, Naomi, in 1970. So, so scandalous. Number 15. King graduated from the University of Maine at Orono in 1970, with a BA in English and the qualification to teach at a high school level. Immediately after graduating, King was subject to a draft board examination to determine whether or not to be drafted in the army and be sent to fight in the Vietnam War. Luckily, King managed to escape the draft due to his high blood pressure, as well as limited vision, flat feet and punctured eardrums, all of which would make for a pretty bad soldier. Number 16. After finishing his edumacation and avoiding being shipped off to Asia to possibly die in the noble fight against communism, King eventually found work as an English teacher in Hampton Academy, a private high school in Connecticut. Ha, Connecticut, I'm just kidding, it was in Maine. Number 17. However, even with his job at a swanky private school, King and his wife struggled financially and lived in a double-wide trailer. To scrape by, King moonlighted as a janitor and gas pump attendant and worked summers at industrial laundry. King did manage to sell a few short stories during this period, though, mostly to men's magazines like Cavalier, but sadly these profits did little to alleviate his financial woes. Number 18. On one occasion, King was issued a fine of $250 for collecting traffic cones and leaving them at the steps of a police station, which he'd taken upon himself to do after several traffic cones had the audacity to damage his car while he was driving drunk. Unable to pay the fine, King faced a penalty of 30 days in jail, until he was saved at the last minute when he received payment for the sale of his story The Raft, which was then under the title of The Float, to a magazine called Adam, who awarded him the princely sum of $250. He couldn't make it up. I mean, Stephen King probably could, not to say that he did, but anyway. Number 19. Nonetheless, King continued to produce short stories and work on novels during the early 70s, and in 1973, a little novel he'd written called Carrie was accepted by publishing house Doubleday. Telling the story of a high school bullying victim who developed supernatural powers, Carrie was the first of King's novels to be published, although it was actually the fourth he'd written. Number 20. And yet, it was almost never published. Carrie began life as a short story intended for Cavalier magazine, but after typing out the first three pages on a portable typewriter he'd borrowed from his wife, King tossed his work in the bin, or, in American, trash. King later opined that it was his considered opinion that he'd written the world's all-time loser. Phew, harsh. Number 21. However, King's adoring wife Tabitha wasn't about to see her man give up that easily. She retrieved the pages from the bin and encouraged him to finish the story, saying that she would assist him with the female perspective. King followed his wife's advice, always advisable, and expanded Carrie into a novel. Number 22, ooh, ooh, oh, me, ow. When Carrie was chosen for publication, the Kings no longer had a phone, which forced Doubleday editor William Thompson to send a telegram instead, because apparently the days of the Wild West extended to the early 1970s. The telegram read, Carrie officially a Doubleday book. Is $2,500 advance okay? The future lies ahead. Love, Bill. Ah, sweet, isn't it? Number 23. King has since divulged that with the advance he received for Carrie, equivalent to roughly $14,000 today, he bought a brand new spanking Ford Pinto, which is the most luxurious car named after a variety of bean. Number 24. Not long afterwards, King signed a year-long teaching contract and went about his merry little life, assuming it wasn't about to change forever. However, on the 13th of May 1973, King's life changed forever, when Thompson called his friend again to tell him that the paperback rights for Carrie had been sold to Signet Books, an imprint of the American publisher New American Library. Oh, and it was sold, by the way, for $400,000, which is the equivalent to $2.2 million today. Number 25. In accordance with King's contract with Doubleday, the money was split between them, bagging King a payment of over a million dollars. With that, King was able to write full-time, and the rest, my dears, is histoire. We are going to tell you, though, what happens next. That's kind of the point of the video, and we're only a quarter in. So, strap in! 
Number 26. At the end of the summer of 1973, the Kings moved their growing family to southern Maine due to the failing health of King's mother, who was suffering with cancer. During this time, Stephen wrote his next published novel, Salem's Lot, and King's mother sadly passed away at the age of 59. Number 27. By this point, King had sadly developed a drinking problem that would plague his life for many years afterwards. Indeed, King has since admitted he was drunk while delivering the eulogy at his mother's funeral. Number 28. Hilariously, which is a weird segue from that last horrible fact, but anyway, the original title for Salem's Lot was Second Coming, but King changed it when his ever insightful wife remarked it sounded like a bad sex story. And let's be honest, she wasn't wrong, especially since I've read my own novel called Second Coming, and bad sex story is exactly how people described it. Number 29. Carrie was finally published in the spring of 1974. Since then, none of Stephen King's books have ever fallen out of print, a very impressive feat achieved by very few writers. Number 30. In the autumn of 1974, the Kings moved to Boulder, Colorado, where they lived for a little less than a year. During this time, King wrote The Shining, which is set in Colorado. King once said in a BBC interview that the character of Jack Torrance was his most autobiographical character, which is more than a little unsettling. At the time, King was struggling more and more with alcoholism, much like Jack was, who King has since said he originally viewed as a heroic character battling his demons in the way strong American men are supposed to do. In other words, not healthily. Number 31. The Kings returned to New England in the summer of 1975, purchasing a home in Bridgeton in the Lakes region of Western Maine, where King finished writing The Stand, much of which is also set in Boulder, Colorado. King's seventh novel, The Dead Zone, was also written in Bridgeton. Number 32. In 1977, the Kings left New England and spent three months of a planned year-long stay in Old England, also known as England, that's where I live, before they cut the trip short and returned home to Maine in December, purchasing a new home in Centre Lavelle. For the next couple of years, the family moved back and forth between Centre Lavelle and Orrington, near Bangor, so King could teach creative writing at the University of Maine, his alma mater. Number 33. During the 70s and 80s, Stephen King would occasionally play poker with Game of Thrones author George R. R. Martin when they were both attending sci-fi conventions. The pair have remained good friends and have since appeared alongside each other at talks and Q&As. Number 34. King has since admitted he was drunk virtually the entire time he was writing his 10th novel, the 1981 psychological horror Cujo, which tells the story of a rabid dog who goes on a human killing spree. As a result, King barely remembers writing any of it at all. Number 35. King has also stated that he wrote all 317 pages of the 1982 sci-fi novel The Running Man over the course of a single week, rather than his usual span of three months. Number 36. By the 1980s, King's problems with alcohol had progressed to other dangerous drugs, particularly cocaine. In 1985, King made his directorial debut with the movie Maximum Overdrive, an adaptation of his short story Trucks, for which he also wrote the screenplay. It would not be unfair to say that upon release, the film was almost universally hated, which probably had something to do with the fact that King was, by his own admission, and I'm quoting here, coked out of his mind all through its production, and that he really didn't know what he was doing. I mean, <laughs> at least he's honest. Number 37. King's drink and drug problem eventually became so serious that his wife was forced to organise an intervention, attended by a group of family and friends, who confronted him about the effect his behaviour was having on his health and relationships. By the late 80s, King had quit all drugs and alcohol, and had been sober ever since. Number 38. In 1986, King published one of his more well-known novels simply entitled It. The book has been adapted to screen more than once, and tells the story of a group of children who are terrorised by an evil entity who primarily appears in the form of a nightmarish clown called Pennywise. Perhaps not unsurprisingly, one of the primary visual inspirations for Pennywise was Ronald McDonald, the mascot of the popular fast food chain McDonald's. Is that how it's pronounced? I'm <laughs> just kidding, I eat it all the time. Number 39. In the original TV miniseries adaptation of it, the terrifying clown was famously played by menacing English actor Tim Curry. However, Curry wasn't the only person considered for the role. Apparently, the godfather of shock rock himself, Alice Cooper, was also in the running for the role, before Curry presumably creeped everyone out enough that they gave him the job out of pure fear. Number 40. In 1987, King published Misery, which tells the story of a popular writer who is held captive by a deranged fan. The book, which was later adapted into a critically acclaimed film of the same name, was partially inspired by the negative fan reaction of one of his previous books, the epic fantasy novel The Eyes of the Dragon. Published only three years prior to Misery in 1984, The Eyes of the Dragon was a departure from King's usual work of horror fiction, which irked many of his fans. As such, the character of Annie Wilkes is a metaphor for some of King's more close-minded readers. Number 41. 
Incidentally, King actually started writing Misery in London's Brown's Hotel, using a desk that once belonged to English writer Rudyard Kipling. Somewhat shockingly, and perhaps appropriately for a horror writer, Kipling died at the very same desk in 1936. The meaning of life. On the 20th of April 1991, the Kings were treated to an unwelcome visit by a gentleman named Eric Keane, who broke into their home in Maine after driving 2,000 miles north from San Antonio, Texas. While King himself wasn't home at the time, his wife Tabitha heard the sound of breaking glass from the kitchen and encountered Keane with what he claimed to be a bomb. After managing to escape, Tabitha ran to a neighbor's house and called the police, who found Keane in the attic with calculator parts assembled to superficially resemble a bomb. Number 43. Keane, who is schizophrenic, apparently believed that King's best-selling novel Misery was based on the life of his aunt, Janine Jones, a convicted serial killer who was thought to have murdered literally dozens of infants while working as a nurse in the late 70s and early 80s. Keane stated that he has written a sequel to King's book and had been attempting unsuccessfully to persuade King to help him get the book published. Yeah, that's... that's not how you do that, Eric. Number 44. In 1996, King collaborated with the late Michael Jackson to create a spooky little short film named Michael Jackson's Ghosts, which features music from Jackson's 1995 album His Story and its accompanying remix album Blood on the Dance Floor His Story in the Mix, released in 1997. Written by King and screenwriter Mick Garris, the short tells the story of a small-minded mayor who tries to run a supernatural maestro out of town. The film was screened at Cannes and set a Guinness World Record for the world's longest music video, a record it later lost to the 24-hour video for Happy by Pharrell Williams. Number 45. On the 19th of June 1999, at roughly 4.30 in the afternoon, King was walking alongside a highway in Maine when he was hit by a van, the driver of which was distracted by his unrestrained dog moving around in the back seat. King was knocked four meters away from the side of the road and was left in critical condition with a collapsed lung, multiple fractures in his leg, a scalp laceration, and a broken hip. Number 46. King's leg was so severely injured that doctors initially thought it would require amputation, though eventually it was saved. After three weeks of hospital care requiring five separate operations, King was released from the Central Maine Medical Center on the 9th of July. Number 47. Brian Smith, the van driver who hit King, had a history of driving offenses, accruing no less than 11 convictions for speeding and driving under the influence since 1989. Smith later had his license revoked for a year and received a suspended prison sentence of six months after pleading guilty to a charge of driving to endanger. Number 48. The following year, in September of 2000, Smith was found dead in an apparent suicide, having reportedly told his friends that he could not face another winter. King later stated he was very sorry to hear of Smith's passing, adding that the death of a 43-year-old man can only be termed untimely. Number 49. Smith's van was later purchased by King's lawyers and crushed at a scrapyard to prevent it ending up on eBay. King has since stated that the car's fate left him disappointed, as he initially wanted to hold a charity event, giving paying individuals the chance to smash up the van with a sledgehammer at the very reasonable rate of $5 for three swings. Number 50. Not long after the events of 9-11 in 2001, someone left a suspicious looking package on King's doorstep. Man, the guy can't catch a break. The package was so suspicious, in fact, the bomb squad were called in to incinerate it. Turns out, though, it was just a copy of King's novel It. Number 51. At the time of making this video, Stephen King has published a total of 60 novels. I guess Stephen King books aren't that novel anymore. Shut up, that was a good joke and I stand by it. Okay? Okay. Number 52. In order to avoid saturating the market, King released seven of his books, namely Rage, The Long Walk, Roadwork, The Running Man, Thinner, The Regulators, and Blaze, under the pseudonym Richard Buckman. Number 53. King created his Richard Buckman pseudonym from Richard Stark the author of a book he was reading at the time, which is actually a pseudonym of Donald Westlake, while listening to the song You Ain't Seen Nothing Yet by Canadian rock group Barkman Turner Overdrive. Do you see where the name came from? Because he put the two together. Yeah. Number 54. Funnily enough, though, this wasn't King's first pick for a pseudonym. He originally wanted the name Gus Pillsbury, presumably taking the surname from his mother's maiden name. At the time, though, word had already gotten out that King would be using this name as a pseudonym, and King has also stated that he really didn't like it that much anyway, so... <laughs> Sorry, Gus Pillsbury, wherever you are. Number 55. In 1985, however, a particularly astute bookstore clerk in Washington, D.C. named Steve Brown noticed that Buckman's writing style was remarkably similar to that of King, and with a little more sleuthing, managed to uncover King's ruse. Number 56. Sometime after Brown revealed that Richard Buckman and Stephen King were in fact the same person, King announced he would be retiring his now useless alias, stating that Buckman had in fact died of cancer of the pseudonym. Nasty way to go. Number 57. 
Incidentally, King is also written under the name John Swithin, which was the pseudonym he used to publish his short story The Fifth Quarter in Cavalier in April of 1972, two years before the publication of his career-making novel Carrie. Interestingly, the John Swithin does actually appear in Carrie as the name of a folk musician who played the Ewan High School Spring Ball in June of 1979. Number 58. King has also penned a number of non-fiction books, the most well-known of which is likely his memoir on writing A Memoir of the Craft, in which he discusses his experiences as a writer and offers advice to aspiring writers. Number 59. Throughout his career, Stephen King's books have sold 350 million copies, in fact more than that, making him one of the best-selling authors of all time, and don't you forget it. Number 60. The works of Stephen King have been translated into at least 50 different languages, and have been published in over 35 different countries, which I'm going to assume is more than you. Feel free to let us know in the comments if you can do better than that. Number 61. King has also written approximately 200 short stories, most of which have been published in various book collections. If you ever need a short story, just talk to Stephen. He'll sort you out. Probably for a price, though. Number 62. Speaking of short stories, King is well known for his generous policy of allowing anyone to buy in the film rights for his short stories for the princely sum of one American dollar. King retains specific rights over the films, which he affectionately refers to as dollar babies, including the right to view them before they are screened and the restriction that they may not be exhibited commercially without his approval. Number 63. In recognition of his accomplishments, King has received numerous literary awards and accolades, including Bram Stoker Awards, World Fantasy Awards, and British Fantasy Society Awards. In 2003, the National Book Foundation awarded him the Medal for Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, which sounds just as fancy as it is. Nintendo 64. King has also been commended for his contribution to literature based on his entire oeuvre, receiving prestigious accolades like the World Fantasy Award for Life Achievement in 2004 and the Grand Master Award from the Mystery Writers of America in 2007. In 2015, King was awarded the National Medal of Arts from the United States National Endowment for the Arts in recognition for his contributions to literature. Number 65. King was also the very first author to have three titles on the weekly bestsellers list simultaneously, namely Firestarter, The Dead Zone, and The Shining. Number 66. Today, King's estimated annual salary is somewhere in the region of $40 million, according to Forbes. This figure easily makes him one of the world's richest writers, and means he makes almost as much as my dear Jennifer Lawrence, who in 2016 made $46 million being the ray of heavenly light that she is. Number 67. King has accrued a variety of nicknames throughout his career, most notably the King of Horror and the Master of Mystery. I'll tell you the nicknames I've had in my life, but the only one I can repeat is Fact Boy, and honestly, that's more of a personal insult, especially coming from a toaster. Number 68. Stephen King holds the world record, by a considerable margin I might add, for the highest number of motion picture adaptations of a living author. So, screw yourself, Dan Brown, author of The Da Vinci Code. Ha! Take that! Number 69 work and no play makes Sam a dull boy. However, King famously disliked one of the most well-known adaptations of his work, namely Stanley Kubrick's 1980 film interpretation of The Shining. Despite the fact the film is widely considered to be one of the greatest horror films ever made, King claims that the film mishandled or omitted many of the novel's more important themes, and was opposed to the casting of Jack Nicholson, who he believed was so closely associated with villainous characters that the audience would easily anticipate his descent into madness. But how do you feel about the film? Do you think Kubrick did a good job? Or do you think King was right and that it sucked real bad? Let us know in our fancy YouTube poll, or in the comments down below. Number 70. Rob Reiner's 1986 film Stand By Me, which is based on King's 1982 novella The Body, and tells the story of four young boys who go on a journey to find the dead body of another boy, was accidentally set in Oregon. This is because, in the original story, King only mentioned that the fictional town of Castle Rock is near Portland, without specifying that he meant Portland, Maine. You'd think someone would have checked, but I guess not. Number 71. Still, after watching the first cut of Stand By Me, King found himself in tears, and stated that it was the closest adaptation to one of his novels that he'd ever seen. I guess the trivial matter of accidentally setting the film on the opposite side of the country wasn't all that important. Number 72. King also once wrote a musical, entitled Ghost Brothers of Darkland County. He wrote it with the American musicians John Mellencamp and T-Bone Burnett. The show debuted in 2012 and tells the chilling story that came with the house that Mellencamp bought in Indiana. Apparently, the woods surrounding the home are haunted by the ghosts of three siblings, two brothers and one sister, who were once playing in the area when one of the brothers was accidentally shot. Terrified, the remaining brother and sister got in a car to go and get help, before swerving off the road, hitting a tree and dying instantly. Number 73. 
In case you didn't know, by the way, there was a musical version of Carrie that was first staged by the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford-upon-Avon, England in 1988, and then on Broadway later that year. Reaction, though, was extremely mixed, prompting boos mixed in with standing ovations and a series of scathing reviews, which saw the $8 million show close after only 16 previews and five performances. An off-Broadway revival of the play was staged in 2012 to far more positive reviews, though, leading to further productions across the globe. Number 74. During one of his talks alongside George R.R. R. Martin, King stated that he generally aims to write six pages a day, which is a hilarious thing to say right in the face of George R.R. R. Martin. Number 75. Naturally, King is an insanely avid reader himself, believing that if one doesn't have the time to read, one doesn't have the tools to write. So deep. King claims that he gets through up to 80 books a year, most of which are fiction. Number 76. King also has a library made up of 17,000 books, and claims that he's read all of them, except only new additions to his collection. Number 77. King has stated he experiences triskaidekaphobia, which is a fear of the number 13. He's so creeped out by the number that he never finishes writing on page 13 and either to multiples or the numbers 94, 193, or 382, since the sum of the individual digits in those numbers all add up to 13. Number 78. Apparently, Mr. King listens to rock music while he writes in order to get inspired. Two of his favourite bands are the hard rock giants ACDC and renowned punk band The Ramones. Number 79. In fact, King is such a huge Ramones fan, he even penned the liner notes to the 2002 Ramones tribute album, We're a Happy Family. Number 80. In case we hadn't impressed upon you exactly how much King enjoys rock music, you should probably know that he's actually a member of an all-writer rock band called the Rock Bottom Remainders. Alongside writers such as Amy Tan, Dave Barry, Scott Turow, Roy Blount Jr. and James Luca McBride. According to Barry, the band's motto is we play music as well as Metallica writes novels. I haven't read any Metallica novels, but I imagine they're not very good. Number 81. Not only that, Stephen and Tabitha King own Zone Radio, which itself owns three radio stations in Maine, one of which, WKIT FM, is known by the tagline Stephen King's Rock and Roll Station. Number 82. King has three children with his wife, Tabitha. His eldest is his daughter, Naomi, who is a Unitarian Universalist minister. Ooh. He also has two sons, Joe and Owen King. Wait, Joe King? No way. Anyway, apparently they're both writers themselves. While Joe, for obvious reasons, goes by the pen name Joe Hill, his brother sticks with the actual surname King. Number 83. King owns two neighbouring houses in the city of Bangor in Maine, and has stated he'd like to build an underground tunnel with a rideable trolley going between them. When asked why, he simply replied, because I can. Although, I'm not sure he has yet. Number 84. King found out while appearing on an episode of the American Ancestry show Finding Your Roots that he's 99% European. His ancestry includes mostly Scots-Irish, English, German, Scottish, and Welsh influences. Number 85. King stands at a formidable 193 centimeters, or roughly 6 foot 4, and weighs approximately 200 pounds. This is all important information if you want to ever forcibly kidnap Stephen King, which we do not recommend here on 101 Facts. Number 86. King has revealed he has a predisposition for macular degeneration, an incurable condition that results in blurred or no vision in the center of the visual field. King has required glasses for most of his life, and while he is not yet presenting any symptoms, his vision may deteriorate considerably as he gets older. Number 87. As well-known figures in the literary world, Stephen and Tabitha King use their considerable wealth and influence to provide scholarships for high school students, and make significant contributions to many other local and national charities. Number 88. In 1992, Stephen and Tabitha King gave a substantial donation to build Mansfield Stadium in Bangor, Maine, with the sole stipulation that the stadium scoreboard be placed such that it would be visible from their house while King works. Today, the stadium is affectionately known as Stephen King's Field of Screams. Number 89. Though Stephen is most comfortable writing, he has occasionally lent his creative powers to the world of TV and film, and has over 22 film appearances on IMDb, constituted by various cameos, mostly in the film adaptations of his works. For example, in the 1989 film adaptation of Pet Cemetery, he plays a minister, but he also appeared as a mouthy bus driver in an episode of the 1991 TV series The Golden Years. So, that's a mixed resume. Number 90. King also appeared as Geordie Verrill in the 1982 American horror comedy anthology film Creepshow, which was written by King himself and directed by the iconic horror filmmaker George A. Romero. 
The film also included an appearance from King's son, Joe, who appeared as Billy. Number 91. In 1988, King was offered the chance to write and direct A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. But King declined for unknown but pretty obvious reasons. Number 92. King was such a fan of Danny Boyle's 2002 post-apocalyptic horror film 28 Days Later that he bought out an entire showing of the film in New York City, just so he could watch it by himself and not be distracted by the lowest dregs of society, also known as other cinema goers. Scum, subhuman scum. Number 93. King is also a huge fan of the hit ABC TV series Lost, the creators of which cited King as an influence on the show which often includes references to his work. King even trusted Lost creators J.J. Abrams and Damon Lindelof with adapting his Dark Tower books into a film series, which didn't happen, but maybe should have done. Number 94. King is also a noted fan of J.K. Rowling, who's one of the very few writers in history to outsell him, which she did across far fewer books. King has even written reviews for her wildly successful Harry Potter novels for Entertainment Weekly magazine. Number 95. Somewhat controversially, King once wrote an extremely complimentary review of the psychological thriller horror novella Fear. It's not that weird, right? But it is when you consider it was written by the American writer and religion founder L. Ron Hubbard. You know, the S word. King even went so far to describe the book as a classic, after noting that the term is often overused. Number 96. King is a committed fan of the Boston Red Sox, which Google reliably informs me is an American baseball team. Not only did King write a story about the Boston Red Sox entitled The Girl Who Loved Tom Gordon, he also had yet another movie cameo in the film Fever Pitch, which stars Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore and tells the story of a crazed Red Sox fan. King plays himself and throws out the pitch at a game. Number 97. It's well known that King doesn't sign autographs due to his own personally held superstitious beliefs. Is what an incorrect person would say. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right, this late on and that happens. Didn't expect that, baby. In actual fact, King dislikes signing autographs because he hates the idolatry of celebrities, which is the same reason why he does not endorse an official fan club. According to his website, King only signs autographs at book signings. Number 98. Another rumor claims that if sent a book to sign, he will burn it and return the ashes. While that does sound like something Stephen King would do, it isn't actually something that Stephen King does. Sorry. Number 99. King is an outspoken critic of Donald Trump, and appears to take substantial pleasure in the fact that Trump has blocked him on Twitter, which he talked about gleefully during an appearance on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert. Number 100. He once told fellow author Neil Gaiman, what a conversation that would have been, that if he had the chance to live life over again, he wouldn't change a thing, with the sole exception of appearing in an American Express advert. Number 101. We all float down here. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a last fact for you. Stephen King once appeared in an American Express advert in the mid 80s. <laughs> what a loser. Just kidding, American Express, if you want a sponsor, let me know, babes. <laughs> right. Anyway, that was 101 facts about Stephen King. Spooky stuff, right? Is he your favorite author? What's your favorite one of his works? Let me know in the comments down below. Also remember to check out Rose by Rami Ungar. Spookalicious stuff. The link is in the description and the pinned comment down below. In the meantime, though, let us know what you want to see on 101 Facts and subscribe, because, you know, it's pretty cool and happening down here. In the meantime, though, two videos on screen right now. Check them out, I dare ya. Get it? Because it's, like, horror-themed. They're probably not that scary, though. Anyway, bye!